Today we have discussed about uh, cerebral cortex and sensory areas in the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex forms a complete covering of the cerebral hemisphere. Cerebral cortex forms a complete covering of the cerebral hemisphere. It consists of gray matter. So cerebral cortex is composed of the gray matter. Thickness of the cerebral cortex is about uh, 2 to or 3 to 5 millimeter. So 3 to 5 millimeter is the thickness of the cerebral Cerebral cortex is thrown into folds which are called gyri, separated by fissures or salsa. So cerebral cortex thrown into folds or gyri, separated by fissures or salsa. The total surface area of the cerebral cortex is one quarter millimeter square. So one quarter, uh, so meter square, meter square is the surface area of the cerebral cortex. One quarter meter, meter square is the surface area of the cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is thickest thickest at the top of the gyrus, thickest at the top of the gyrus, and thinnest at the bottom of the gyrus. So thickest at the top of the gyrus and thinnest at the bottom of the gyrus. Cerebral cortex consists of six layers. So six layers of the cerebral cortex, outermost molecular layer, then external granular layer, external pyramidal layer, internal granular layer, ganglionic layer or internal pyramidal layer, and that sixth layer is the multiform layer or layer of polymorphic cells. So multiform layer or layer of the polymorphic cells. Molecular layer, the outermost layer, contains a dense network of nerve fibers. Contains a dense network of nerve fibers. So there are dendrites coming from deeper layers and also axons coming from deeper layers. So there are dendrites of pyramidal cells, dendrites of stellar cells, which are coming from the deeper layer to the molecular layer. Then is the external granular layer. Consists of stellar cells and small pyramidal cells. Stellar cells and small pyramidal cells are present in the external granular, external granular layer. Third layer is external pyramidal layer, which contains pyramidal cells, pyramidal cells, their dendrites pass through the outer layers, and their axons, these pass into the white matter. These pass into the white matter. Then is the internal granular layer consisting of stellar cells, stellar cells, and some pyramidal cells. Stellar cells and some pyramidal cells, these are present in the internal granular layer. In this layer, there is a band of nerve fibers which is called the external band of 
the larger 24th layer, internal granular layer, there is a band of nerve fibers called external band of the larger. External band of the larger. Then we come to the fifth layer, ganglionic layer or internal pyramidal layer. Internal pyramidal layer or ganglionic layer containing large, very large, and medium sized pyramidal cells. So containing large and very large and medium sized pyramidal cells. And this also contains a band of nerve fibers or the inner band of the larger. So in the fifth layer, there is the band of nerve fiber, the inner band of the larger, inner band of the larger. Then is the, now in this uh, fifth layer, in the precentral glides, there is primary motor area, primary motor area. So in this part of cellular cortex, fifth layer contains very large joint pyramidal cells which are called uh, bed cells. So bed cells are present in the fifth layer in the primary motor area in the precentral gyrus and these are called bed cells. What are these bed cells? Very large joint pyramidal cells which are called bed cells. So bed cells give rise to nerve fibers and these nerve fibers of the bed cell, these form 3% of the nerve fibers in the corticospinal tract. So nerve fibers of bed cells, these form 3% of the nerve fiber, of the nerve fibers in the bed cells. Then comes the sixth layer, that is the multiform layer, or layer of the polymorphic cell. Layer of the polymorphic cells, it contains cells of different shape, different morphologies. So it contains cells of different shape or different morphology. Some are modified pyramidal cells, some are modified standard cells, and other cells are there in the multiform layer or layer of the polymorphic cell. So these are these six layers present in the cellular cortex, in the cerebral cortex. But there are some areas in cerebral cortex where six layers are distinct. In other parts of cerebral cortex, the six layers are not distinct. Are not distinct. If all the six layers are distinct, if all the six layers are distinct, it is called homotypical. Homotypical. If all the six layers are not distinct, not distinct, it is called heterotypical. Metro typical. If all the six layers are not distinct, it is called heterotypical. So homotypical, all the six layers are distinct, can be recognized. If all the six layers are not distinct, it is called heterotypical. So there are two types of heterotypical cellular cortex. Two types of heterotypical granular and a granular granular and a granular in granular type of heterotypical cellular cortex granular layers i mean external granular layer and internal granular layer it means layer number 2 and 4 layer number 2 and 4 are distinct, well developed, while their pyramidal layers are not well developed. Pyramidal layers are not well developed. 
So granular layers, layer number two and four are well developed, while the pyramidal layers are not well developed. This is the granular type of cortex. And this cortex is present in the postcentral gyrus. In the postcentral gyrus, where there is sensory, somatic sensory area. Somatic sensory area. It is also present in the superior temporal gyrus, this auditory area, and also in parts of hippocampal gyrus. In parts of hippocampal gyrus. So granular type of cerebral cortex is present in sensory areas, in the postcentral gyrus, in superior temporal gyrus, and also in the portion of hippocampal gyrus. The other type of heterotypical cerebral cortex is a granular, a granular cortex. A granular cortex. In a granular cortex, pyramidal layer, pyramidal layers are well developed. I mean, external pyramidal layer and internal pyramidal layer. Layers number three and five, three and five are well developed. Three and five are well developed. This is the cortex which is called a granular cortex. Layer number three and five are well developed. Pyramidal layers are well developed. And this type of cortex is present in the precentral gyrus and other parts of the frontal lobe. So in the precentral gyrus and other parts of the frontal lobe the cortex is a granular. And you know, these parts of the cerebral cortex contain motor areas. So in motor areas, the cerebral cortex is a granular type where the pyramidal layers are well developed. So this is about the cerebral cortex and briefly the structure and the types the homotypical, heterotypical, and then the type granular and agranular type of cerebral cortex. Cerebral cortex is divided into functional areas. And these functional areas are numbered. And these are Broadman's number. Broadman's number. Broadman's number. You see the Broadman number or different areas in the cerebral cortex. And these are the functional areas in the cerebral cortex. I discuss about the sensory areas, sensory areas in the cerebral cortex. Now, how these sensory areas have been investigated, or the sensory areas have been investigated. So there are three methods used to investigate the sensory areas. Three methods. Ablation method. Ablation method. A part of cerebral cortex is destroyed and the effects are studied. A portion of cerebral cortex is destroyed and the effects are noted. This is the ablation method. The second method is evoked potential method. Evoked potential method. Now in the evoked potential method, stimuli 
called applied stimuli are applied to different parts of the body and action potential is recorded on the cerebral cortex. So we apply stimuli to different parts of the body and action potentials are recorded from the cerebral cortex. These are called evoked potential method to study the sensory areas. The third method is the study of disease having sensory loss. Study of disease having sensory loss. So a patient having sensory loss after death after death, there is post-mortem examination. After death, there is post-mortem examination. And we see which part of the brain, cerebral cortex, is damaged in the patient who was having sensory loss. So which part of cerebral cortex is damaged in the patient who was having sensory loss. This is the a uh, study of disease in patients having sensory loss. Now we come to the sensory areas in the cerebral cortex. The first of these is somatic sensory area 1. Somatic sensory area 1. Or area S1. Area S1. Located in the post central gyrus, you know, this is the center sulcus, and behind the center sulcus, there is somatosensory area 1. So, behind it, there is fat sensory area 1. It is located, located on the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere located on the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere in the post central gyrus and also extends onto the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere also extends onto the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere in this area there is topographical representation of different parts of the body. In this area, there is topographical, topographical representation of different parts of the body. There is contralateral representation. There is contralateral representation. I mean, right side of the body is represented in the left hemisphere and vice versa. So contralateral representation and then also there is upside down representation. There is upside down representation. So contralateral representation and there is also upside down representation. Upside down representation. You see, this is the area S1, right? And it is Broadman's area 3 to 1, or 1 to 3. It is Broadman area 1 to 2, 3. 1 to 3, Broadman's number 1 to 3 is the Sumit sensory area 1. So you see the body parts representation in this area, body parts representation in this area. This is the lateral surface of the cerebral hemisphere. This is the medial surface. And you see there is upside down representation. I mean, 
on the rectal surface of hemisphere. In the lowermost part, you see the tongue, jaw, lips, of course face, then thumb, fingers, hand, then thigh, leg, thorax, right? And you see the thigh, leg, these are feet, these are on the major surface. So this is the upside down representation in the area S1, that is somatic sensory area 1, upside down representation. The one important uh, observation you must have made is that some parts of the body are represented by larger area. Some parts of the body are represented by much larger area. So area of representation, area of representation of different body parts is not according to the anatomical size. So body parts representation is not according to the anatomical size, but according to the physiological importance. But according to the physiological importance. So area of representation of body parts is not according to the anatomical size, but according to the physiological importance. So body parts containing greater number of sensory receptors. So body parts having greater number of sensory receptors occupy larger area in this representation. So body parts containing greater number of sensory receptors occupy larger area of representation. So these body parts you see in area S1, these form the figure of the body. And the figure of the body formed in area S1 is called sensory homunculus. It's called sensory Sensory homunculus. So a figure of the body is formed in this area. And this is called sensory homunculus. <coughs> sensory homunculus. In this sensory homunculus, much larger area is occupied by the lips or jaw, face then thumb, fingers, hand. Much less, less area occupied by the arms, thorax, and the legs, etc. Right? So this is the physiological representation in the sensory human plus in the area S1, that is the somatic sensory area. And this is Broadman's area, one, two, three. So keep in mind that in this metric sensory area S1, there are vertical columns of neurons. There are vertical columns of neurons. And each vertical column of neuron has a diameter of 0.3 to 0.5 millimeter. So there are vertical columns of neuron in the somatic sensory area, each having a diameter of 0.3 to 0.5 millimeter. And each vertical column contains about 10,000 
neurons. So each vertical column, which is 0.3 to 0.5 millimeter in diameter, contains about 10,000 10,000 neurons. And keep in mind, each vertical column of neurons respond to one modality of sensation. Each vertical column neuron responds to one modality of one modality of sensation. So keep in mind that there is contralateral representation of the body parts in area S1. But face has some bilateral representation. Face has some bilateral representation. Area S1, it receives nerve fibers of the sensory tracts, of the sensory tracts mainly from the ventral posterolateral nucleus of thalamus. So this area is one, it receives nerve fibers of sensory tracts through the BPN, ventral posterolateral nucleus, and BPN, ventral posteromedial nucleus. BPN and BPN, BPN and BPN, from these thalamic nuclei, it receives the nerve fiber. What are the functions of this somatic area, somatic sensory area one? This area receives impulses of all these sensations, the somatic sensations, somatic sensations from the contralateral side of the body. So receives somatic sensations from the contralateral side of the body. Say, tactile, touch, pressure, tickle and itch, vibration, proprioception, tactile discrimination, pain, temperature, right? So these sensations are received by this area S1. And then, in the area S1, there is discrimination of the intensity of stimulation. The discrimination of the intensity of stimulation. Discrimination of the intensity of stimulation. Then there is the involved, this area involvement in stereognosis. Involvement in stereognosis, that is ability to identify the texture, shape of the object by touching with hand, with closed eyes. So ability to identify the texture, shape of the object by touching with hand with closed eyes. This is called stereognosis. So these are the functions of this area S1. Now when there is region of this area, when there is region of this area, pain is least affected. Pain is least affected. The, the most affected sensation will be tactile discrimination and proprioception. So most affected sensation will be tactile discrimination and proprioception. And pain is least affected when there is damage to the region of the somatic sensory area 1. Pain is least affected and most affected will be the tactile discrimination and proprioception. Now when there is recovery, pain is first to recover, pain is first to recover, followed by the tactile discrimination and then the proprioception. So this was about the area S1 or smart sensory area 1, Broadman's area 1, 2, 3. The next sensory area is somatic sensory area 2.
automatic CNC area two. Now we are discussing about Subaco sensory area 2 located in the superior wall of the lateral fissure. Located in the superior wall of the lateral fissure. This is the area S2 in the superior wall of the lateral fissure. There is also body parts representation in this area which is not so distinct, which is not so distinct. You see, face is anterior, legs are posterior. Face is anterior, legs are posterior. Now we don't know the function of the this area S2. So we don't know the function of the somatic sensory area 2. But it receives nerve fibers from area S1. So area S2 receives nerve fibers from area S1, from BPL, BPM, thalamic nuclei, and even from the other sensory areas. Even from the other sensory areas, but we don't know its exact function. We don't know its exact function. So this was about the smart sensory area 2, area S2 and we don't know its exact function. Next sensory area is somatosensory association area. Somatosensory association area. Somatosensory association area located in the superior parietal lobe located in the superior parietal lobe behind the area S1 behind the area S1 in the superior parietal lobe this is the somatosensory association area somatosensory association area it is broad man's area 5 7 it is broadband area 5 7. Right? This area receives impulses from somatosensory area 1, receives impulses from somatosensory area 1, and from the visual and auditory areas. From the visual and auditory areas. This area helps in stereognosis. It helps in stereognosis with the help of the past experience. It helps in stereognosis with the help of the with the help of the past experience. Ability to identify the object by touching with hands with closed eyes. This is the stereognosis and we are able to identify the object by touching with hand, closed eye, with the help of the past experience. So when there is damage in this area, I mean superior parietal lobe, there is a specific sensory deficit which is called amorphosynthesis. 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 So when there is damage to this area, there is a specific sensory deficit which is called amorphosynthesis. Amorphosynthesis. The patient is able to recognize, perceive 
one side of the object. Patient is able to recognize or perceive one side of the object. And say the patient has got damaged this area in the right hemisphere. In the right hemisphere. So this patient is not able to recognize the object felt by the left hand. So the side of the object felt by the right hand will be perceived, will be recognized. But that felt by the left hand is not recognized, not perceived. Moreover, the patient forgets, neglects the left side of the body for motor activity. The patient also neglects, forgets to use left side of the body for the motor activity. And this is called amorphosynthesis. Say, region is in the right hemisphere, in this area. The patient is asked to touch object and to recognize the object. So by the right hand, he is able. With the left hand, he is not able to perceive, recognize the left side of the object. Moreover, he forgets, neglects the left side of the body for use in the motor activity. He will not use, he or she will not use the left side of the body for the motor, for the motor activity. This is called amorphosynthesis, amorphosynthesis. The next sensory area is vernix area. Vernix area, also called gnostic area, G N O, gnostic area, Vernix area, gnostic area, sensory speech area, sensory speech area, journal interpretative area, journal interpretative area. So, Wernick area, Gnostic area, sensory speech area, or also called journal interpretative area. This area is concerned with high intellectual function. Concerned with high intellectual function. It is well developed in the dominant hemisphere well developed in the dominant hemisphere. So area concerned with high intellectual function, well developed in the dominant hemisphere. Most of us are right-handed. So which hemisphere is dominant? Left. So in the left side of the hemisphere, it is well developed and concerned with the high intellectual function. Wernick's area is located in the posterior part of the superior temporal guides. So in the posterior part of the superior temporal guides. It broadens area 22. It broadens area 22 is the Wernick area. So Wernick area is Broadman's area 22. This area is concerned with high intellectual function. In this area, the auditory and visual informations are completely understood. Now visual and auditory informations are completely understood. What to be spoken, what to be spoken, what to be written, 
what to be written is decided is decided thoughts are formulated thoughts are formulated thoughts are formulated words are chosen words are chosen to express the thoughts words are chosen to express the thoughts words are arranged into sentences words are arranged into sentences words are arranged into sentences and then from this area impulses are carried by alphabet fasciculus <coughs> to broker speech here from this area impulses are carried along alphabet fasciculus to broker speech area which is the motor speech area <coughs> which is the motor speech area so vernix area is sensory speech area and broker is the motor speech area <coughs> i told you that broker area is involved in high intellectual function thoughts are formulated what to be expressed what to be spoken what to be written is decided words are selected words are arranged into sentences <coughs> and then signals pass from this area to the broker speech area which is the motor speech area this is the vernix area that is the area concerned with high intellectual function next sensory areas include the primary visual area primary visual area broadman area 17 17 then is the secondary visual area secondary visual area broadman area 18 18 is the secondary visual area then some areas here angular gyrus angular gyrus concerned with the interpretation of the visual information so angular angular gyrus between the vernix area and area 18 that sex secondary visual area is angular gyrus here also concerned with the interpretation of the uh, visual information then there is primary auditory area area 44 and then there is auditory interpretative area or secondary auditory area in the temporal lobe these are also sensory area the primary auditory area area 44 and uh, sorry area uh, okay, which is the area 41 so i got the area 41 and then is the auditory interpretative areas in the temporal lobe Area forty one is the primary auditory area. Then this taste area is shown in this figure. Taste area is located is located in the superior wall of the retinal fissure and at the lower end of the postcentral gyrus. So taste area located. in the wall of the in the superior wall superior wall of the lateral fissure lateral sulcus and inferior end of the postcentral gyrus and also in the adjoining insula in the adjoining insula so taste area located in the inferior end of the postcentral gyrus superior wall of the lateral sulcus and in the adjoining insula and this is the broadman area 43 so area 43 area 43 is the uh, taste area right so primary area area 41 right then uh, primary visual area 17 secondary visual area area 18 angular gyrus is area 39 so angular gyrus which i mentioned is area 39 So area 39 is the angular. This is the broadman's area 39, which is the angular gyrus. This was about the 
sensory areas in the cerebral cortex. Sensory areas in the cerebral. 